Welcome. You've joined the webinar on wound care excellence, making rehab part of the wound care team. On behalf of our sponsors, Wound Rounds and Post-Acute Consulting, we're really pleased to have you join us today. If you're still just logging on to the webinar, rest assured that the first few minutes are about setting expectations and over, uh, going over our agenda so you won't miss too much. For those of you who have been faithfully on the line for several minutes, thank you for bearing with us as we've waited for everybody to join on the call. I thought before we get started today, we might go through a couple details about what to expect. So for starters, I wanted you to know that we're all being recorded today. And when I say all of us, it means me and the panelists, because actually you as participants are muted out, and so you can't actually hear each other. But you do have the opportunity to submit questions. And you do that via your dashboard on your right-hand side. If you see a little orange arrow and click on that, it brings up a screen, and you can type questions into the question area. And what I'll do is I'll hold the questions till the end, and then we'll give those to our panelists, panelists to answer. You also will have the ability to see the contact information for our panelists, and that will facilitate if you want to get back in touch with them offline. And lastly, but probably most importantly, is if you registered for this webinar in advance, you did receive copies of the handouts in advance. But if you don't have the handouts, don't worry. We'll be remailing them to everybody who signed up for the webinar at the end of this event. And that will happen about a day or two after the event ends. And in addition to the handouts, you'll actually get a copy to this archived link, which shows you the handouts and the um, actual video. So one more time about the handouts. You'll get them again. And about questions, make sure that you feel comfortable and ask away on the question panel of your dashboard. And we'll give those to the speakers at the end. So um, at this time, we just want to make sure that you guys know there's a whole host of webinars that are available for your viewing at the Wound Rounds website. And they're specifically on the Learn page at woundrounds.com. So this will join the other webinars that Wound Rounds has been hosting over this past year and hope that you'll check back frequently as we're always adding more webinars to our upcoming list. At this time, what I'd like to do is take a moment to quickly introduce our, our illustrious faculty today. Uh, Cheryl Babin is a physical therapist and a master's in health administration. And she is the senior rehab consultant at Post-Acute Consulting, which is one of our sponsors today. So Cheryl has a really rich background in rehab, and in particular in long-term care. So she does a lot of work in the area of education and support in the area of rehab. And she also works in compliance and other clinical programming areas. So before she was a consultant at Post-Acute Consulting, she had experience running the rehab area at Life Care Centers of America. So we are just thrilled to have Cheryl with us today to help learn about, from a rehab ther therapist perspective, what it's like to integrate rehab to the wound care team. So on the other side of the team would be, of course, the wound care nurses. And joining us from the wound care nurse perspective is Ann Schurig. And Schurig is actually a luminary in the field of wound care. As a certified woundostomy continence nurse, she's had a, a variety of leadership roles in that professional area, including being past president of the Northern Illinois affiliate of this uh, really outstanding organization, and being the former editor of the WOC News. So Anne also today serves as the vice president of clinical operations for Wound Rounds. And Wound Rounds is one of the sponsors of today's webinar. So we're really pleased to have Anne with us today, particularly because she brings a wealth of background, not only from the long-term care areas, but also in acute care and also in working with industry. So we're glad to have Anne joining us today as well. And we'll be shortly handing over this webinar to both Cheryl and Anne for their discussion. But uh, a quick word about me. I'm Deborah Kurtz, and I'll be your moderator today. And I come to you with, as an expert in the area of marketing and in the area of wound care and long-term care. So glad to have you on board today. And I'll be fielding your questions and passing them along to the speakers. But having said that, let's uh, turn this um, webinar over officially to our first panelist, Ann Shirk from Wound Rounds. And she'll review the agenda today. Anne, take it away. Thank you, Deb. And thanks, everybody, for logging in um, and joining us today to discuss this great topic. 
Uh, just a quick review, we're going to talk about the role of the rehab and nursing and wound care and, and what, are, what each player brings to the party um, and how we can get those two players working together. Um, what would the overall benefits of integrating rehab into your wound care team be? We're going to give you some case studies to kind of demonstrate and illuminate um, how that team approach can be effective, and then talk also about some practical tips about bringing rehab into the wound care team just from an organizational level. So the main point we want to make today is that wound care should be a team sport. It should be uh, approached with multiple players. Uh, the key players on that team, well, of course, we start with the physician who writes those wound care orders. Um, we've got nursing who's caring for the overall wellness of that patient or resident, as well as possibly uh, leading the wound care um, plan of care and, and implementation. Um, and we're going to talk today about how to pull rehab into that team, whether it's as the primary wound caregiver or whether it's at, uh, adjunct therapies to the wound care plan. And then also don't forget to include dietary uh, in your team roster. Um, nutrition is a big part of wound healing, and we want to make sure that we're addressing it accurately. So how do you pick the players amongst all of your team members? I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl, and she's going to talk about the rehab component. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, physical therapists are integral members of the interdisciplinary healthcare team. PTs provide assessment and treatment to many different types of patients by using physical interventions. Whether the condition results from an injury or a disease process or other causes, PTs focus primarily on those individuals who have disturbed functions or impairments that are related to the musculoskeletal system, the neurological system, cardiopulmonary, and the integumentary system. PTs evaluate the functioning of all of these systems and apply appropriate treatment interventions primarily to alleviate pain and improve a patient's physical function. These services are in great need by many people of all ages and backgrounds. Physical therapists are of two distinct levels in the United States today. There are physical therapists and there are physical therapist assistants. Physical therapists today, in order to practice in the United States, require a doctorate of physical therapy. All states and territories in the United States also require a license for a physical therapist to practice. And each state requires, at minimum, a national board examination, but there may be additional criteria for obtaining licensure, such as CEUs. Physical therapist assistants must graduate with an associate degree, usually two years, and usually accommodates up to five semesters of training from an accredited, phys accredited physical therapist assistant program. PTs also must pass the national examination for licensing certification regulation in most states to be eligible to work. And PTs assistants work under the direct supervision of a physical therapist. PTs today work in a variety of settings across the continuum of care. We work in hospitals, private practices, outpatient clinics, home health agencies, skilled nursing facilities, schools, sports fitness facilities, along with work settings. It is important to understand that not every physical therapist is passionate and skilled in wound care. So first, it is very a high priority for everyone to consider a passionate therapist who is willing to learn these skills. Teaching and training is much easier to develop than a passion. PTs who are involved in wound care look at a variety of tests and measures related to skin. According to the Commission on Accreditation of Physical Therapy Education in the United States, all physical therapist education programs must provide education and training to their students on wound care to obtain a minimum level of skill and competency. As therapists, our goal is to promote wound healing and to optimize mobility and prevent further complications and to optimize functional mobility to decrease the risk for wounds. 
we initially will complete a screening process and a thorough examination. These are some of the skills we use as PTs related to wound care. From a test and measure standpoint, we are looking at activities, positioning, and postures that the patient assumes and that produce or relieve trauma to the skin. We consider assistive, adaptive, orthotic, protective, supportive, or prosthetic devices and equipment that may produce or relieve trauma to skin. We look at the skin characteristics including blistering, continuity of the skin color, any dermatitis, hair growth, the skin mobility, nail growth, sensation, temperature, texture, and turgor. We also consider activities, positioning, and postures that may aggravate the wound or scar or that produce or relieve trauma. We also want to watch for signs and symptoms of infection specifically looking at the wound and describing any bleeding, the depth, drainage, location, odor, size, and color of the wound. We want to consider wound scar tissue characteristics, including any banding, the pliability, any sensation or texture issues. Besides these specific wound-related assessments, we also would conduct additional tests and measures we obviously want to look at the impact on the patient's function. So we're considering their gait, their locomotion, and its impact on their balance. We also will assess the patient's pain and sensation and their self-care skills and home management skills. As therapists, we always want to consider the patient's prognosis, develop an effective plan of care, and look at how we're going to treat this patient through our interventions. Coordination of care, particularly within the interdisciplinary team and partnering with nursing is a high priority. We want to make sure that we're providing education to our patients and our patient caregivers in order to optimize function. And our protection techniques may include, as therapists, actually doing and using modalities perhaps consider debridement, utilizing dressings and topical agents, look at positioning as well as adaptive equipment and or specialty surface considerations, and always patient, family, and colleague education. I'm going to pop the presentation back to Anne, who's going to review the nurse's role in wound care. Thank you, Cheryl. So from a nursing perspective, you know, nursing is a profession that's focused on the care of the individual, the family, the community that they're in. We're always striving to help a patient attain and maintain their optimal level of health. Um, nurses can differentiate their approach to patient care based on training and their scope of practice from the LPN to the advanced practice or nurse practitioner. Um, nursing practice varies widely uh, across uh, our state based on what your licensure allows you to do within your state um, nurse practice act. And many nurses provide care uh, within the ordering scope of physicians. And so this has kind of shaped the public of opinion of or secondary in the uh, decision process under the physician, um, which is true as far as uh, the legal side of things in writing orders. But we know that nursing is really primary in knowing that patient or resident and understanding their overall well-being. Uh, from a training and background, you know, all states in, in the United States uh, require licensure. Uh, everyone takes an FLEX exam. And then individual states ha may have uh, additional criteria around continuing education and reporting uh, within their state practice act. Uh, wound certified nurses can vary. There are a number of programs out there for credentialing. The WOCN credentials nurses in wound, ostomy, and continence care. And uh, you need a baccalaureate degree or higher to sit for the WOCN study and sit for the WOCN exam. There's the wound care certification program that will program, uh, will educate anyone in the program who has a license to practice within their state. So that could be an LPN a physical therapist, uh, a physician, anyone with a license. And then there's the CWS Certified Wound Specialist, which is a self-study program 
that allows you to take an exam and become certified as well. Keep in mind that LPNs and LVNs may be certified in some of these programs, but need to work under the direction of a registered nurse uh, when they're working in wound care. Uh, much like the physical therapist, nurses practice in a variety of settings from hospitals to home health in the community, as well as schools and in the um, occupational health environment in work settings. When we look at a wound, we're looking at how to best assess and document that wound, and that's the first place we start. And we start with the etiology of the wound. What's the underlying disease or condition that contributed to this wound? Is it an underlying vascular disease that uh, ended up in um, a venous stasis uh, in the lower extremity, or is it uh, maybe a CVA or uh, other type of injury that prevents the patient from being maximizing their mobility, and therefore they've developed pressure ulcers? Um, then we want to look at the actual location. Where on the body is this wound, and how do we best describe it? And then we classify the wound. Is it pressure? Is it vascular? Is it a trauma? Or is it um, a rash or a metabolic reaction? Um, we get into sizing, measuring head to toe and side to side as well as depth. And we want to make sure that we're clear about describing that peri wound margin so that we uh, can capture what the skin is looking like outside of the wound itself and whether how we're treating that wound is impacting that peri wound margin. Uh, you want to make sure you describe the wound edge. You know, is it clean and, and definable? Is it undermined? Is it rolled? Um, that will impact how your progress of healing is charted. Um, certainly you want to capture the different tissue types in the wound and at what percentage, as well as what kind of exudate is uh, coming off that wound and again in what amount, because that's going to help you drive uh, what type of dressings you select to address that wound. Um, certainly the presence of undermining and tunneling are significant, again, from a treatment standpoint as well as from a, a monitoring outcomes. And then we want to give a subjective outcome to our overall assessment as to whether we think that this wound is going to heal or not. Not all wounds are healable, and so we want to make sure that we state that clearly um, and make our objectives appropriate to the individual. When you're considering what type of dressings to use, I um, oftentimes fall back to the time principle of wound bed prep. This is a a principle that was developed by Dr. Schultz, Sibold, and Falaga back in 2003 and has been published multiple times. And it's a great guideline to help you determine how do I go about approaching this wound. So the T stands for tissue. Is there non-viable or deficient tissue in the wound bed? If basically this means if you have necrotic tissue or non-viable tissue, you have to get rid of that first whether it's through sharp debridement, enzymatic debridement, or autolytic debridement, you have to get that non-viable tissue out of the way so that there's room for the healthy tissue to take hold and fill in the wound bed. Next thing you want to do is make sure that there's not infection or inflammation. Both infection and inflammation in the wound bed will impede your healing. So even though you have a clean wound bed, if you've got a colonized wound bed, you're not going to get that healthy granulation tissue that's going to migrate in and fill in your wound for healing. Most importantly, you want to concentrate on moisture control. And this is the biggest challenge. Wound beds like to be moist. They like to be moist in just the right balance. And finding that balance is part of the art of doing wound care on every individual patient. You don't want that wound drowning if it's putting off a copious amount of drainage, or if you're using an enzyme or autolytic debridement and breaking down a lot of necrotic tissue that's going to contribute to high drainage, then you want to make sure you're managing that moisture so that you don't damage your peri wound margin and um, impede healing from that perspective. Uh, the reverse of that is being too dry. Uh, it used to be, you know, leave it open to air and let it scab. That was the old principle. Uh, when I back first started wound care, we'd slather them with milk and magnesia and put them under a heat lamp and dry them out. Um, boy, what we've learned in the years since then we found that uh, uh, not only granulation tissue, but also epithelial tissue likes to be in a slightly moist environment and grows best in a slightly moist environment. So if the wound bed is too dry, you want to be adding moisture, whether that's through a hydrogel type of product or a moisture retentive dressing, and there's multiple of those. Once you get that moisture balance controlled and you've got nice granulation tissue that's filled in the wound bed, then we concentrate on that epidermal margin, making sure that um, that the wound bed is healthy enough to have uh, 
progression of the epidermis and the epidermal cells across to close up that wound. And sometimes in a chronic wound, we get non-migrating teracinocytes, um, and the wound bed becomes non-responsive. So it was one sink and granulating, but it's been there so long that it's kind of lost its own. And sometimes we have to add biologicals, whether that's through a collagen, uh, through an adjunctive therapy that Cheryl's going to talk about in a minute, or through um, a biological or engineered skin, um, such as Aplograph or Dermograph, one of those products, Graph Jacket, to help close over that and um, help that epidermis take hold and close up. So looking at that time principle will guide you through, from a nursing perspective, how to address that wound each step of the way. So let's talk about the benefits of integrating rehab into that wound care team. From Cheryl's perspective, what she brings to, um, what skills she brings to that team approach. Thanks, Ann. As physical therapists, we want to be able to provide intervention before an actual wound occurs. We need to look beyond the wound and identify any opportunities to elim eliminate the risk or chance of a wound developing or worsening. We will consider, for example, the patient's functional mobility, how they move in and around their bed, what is their transfer status like, are they using a wheelchair for mobility, or are they able to walk, and what is their gait pattern like. Then we need to consider what adaptations need to be made to the patient's mobility to eliminate any trauma or risk for a wound developing. So we may need to consider adaptive devices or equipment such as offloading shoes, for example, and address the patient's ability to move safely in and around their environment. We always want to make sure that we are assessing the patient's balance and their skill and reduce the chance or risk for falls, for example, if we happen to have to offload um, a, a person's uh, weight and therefore because of that balance shift, what is the impact on their function? And we also want to consider what is the distribution of that patient's body weight through a postural alignment and assessment. As physical therapists, we're also looking at the patient's joint integrity and their mobility. Our job is to prevent contractures and increase joint mobility. So is there any splinting that is going on in regards to the wound and or because they are at risk for a potential contracture, what can we do to assist them and reduce that chance? We're always looking at environmental modifications. We certainly want to work with nursing on looking at the bed surface assessments and also positioning devices while in bed and then also while out of bed. What is their seating? What are they sitting on? What are they sitting in? Do they need a cushion? What type of cushion do they need? And also looking at a wheelchair assessment to keep that normal body alignment present. We want to consider any heel lifts or bed cradles or heel protectors to be used while in bed to keep that foot and lower extremities in uh, optimal alignment and also to assist in circulation for air um, to help with healing. We may consider looking at trapeze bars and any transfer aids or transfer boards so that the patient can maximize their functional mobility to get in and out of bed or change surfaces so that we uh, maintain that independence. And last but not least, certainly the most overlooked area in um, our world is footwear. Um, what type of shoe is uh, the patient wearing? How old is it? Is it supportive? Are there any friction areas that potentially can cause trauma to the foot? What is the impact on this footwear? And what do we need to do to adapt and to get um, best footwear for optimal function? Pain management is a high focus for all of us on the interdisciplinary team. So as therapists, we have many options to consider in controlling pain. We would look at non-pharmaceutical options to help us such as offloading devices, elevation of the extremities, considering bed cradles, and or actually using splints. We can also consider any of the psychological interventions and use relaxation training and biofeedback to help minimize the sensory stimuli to the patient. 
Well, physical therapists can also provide actual treatment to the wound. We have training and expertise in modalities and treatment tools that we traditionally have used to treat pain, inflammation, and muscle weakness. However, modalities such as electrical stimulation, ultrasound, and diathermy are now used to assist in the wound healing process. Let's take a look at electrical stimulation. We know that electrical stimulation uses uh, electrical current to transfer energy to the wound to jumpstart the wound healing process. By using electrical stimulation, we are able to increase oxygen and nutrient transport to the tissue. We also physiologically will see a reduction in edema and pain, and its role is to increase fibroblastosis and collagen development. We've also seen improvement with scar tissue elasticity. When using electrical stimulations, physical therapists control the polarity between the pads based on its setup. With negative polarity, the effects on wound healing are epidermal proliferation and migration, increased blood flow, fibroblast proliferation, enhanced collagen synthesis, decreasing edema, and stimulating granulation. By using positive polarity, the effects on wound healing are, during the proliferative phase, we see the greatest effect by attracting macrophages and, help, and facilitating epithelial growth and granulation, form, granulation formation. Some of the indications for electrical stimulation are with treating pressure ulcers, and we'll talk about that further in a minute, venous ulcers, traumatic wounds, surgical wounds, ischemic ulcers, donor sites, wound flaps, and burns. However, contraindications for e-stim would be the presence of osteomyelitis, the presence of a cardiac pacemaker, malignancy, and specific electrode placement locations such as not over the carotid sinus. So there are some reimbursement issues to consider when using electrical stimulation with pressure ulcers. We need to keep in mind that a wound, in order to use e-stim with a pressure ulcer, it has to be at least chronic, which is a stage 3 or greater that has not healed with, within 30 days of occurrence. The 30-day count does start from onset, so we cannot use e-stim as an initial treatment. Conservative standard wound therapy has to be trialed for at least 30 days without any measurable signs of healing before we can consider electrical stimulation for healing pressure ulcers. Moving on to diathermy. Diathermy is a method of physical therapy that involves generating local heat in body tissues by using high frequency electromagnetic currents. The settings of the diathermy for treating wounds is on the pulsed setting. Some of the indications for using diathermy in wound care is to help increase blood flow, circulation, increase tissue elasticity, and also to reduce pain and inflammation. Again, there are contraindications with using diathermy if the patient has any metal implants or a pacemaker, if the patient is pregnant or has any malignancy, if there is an act active, any active bleeding, or any acute infective process going on. Now, depending upon your state practice act and requirements, physical therapists may be involved in the debridement of a wound. Now, we all know that there are two different types of debridement. There are selective and non-selective. Selective, we're focusing on non-viable tissue. And usually, this is done by using specific wound treatments and dressings. And as Ian touched on earlier, there is the autolytic approach, the enzymatic approach, and the biosurgical approach. The non-selective interventions that we consider might be mechanical, such as whirlpool or wet-to-dry dressings, 
or scrubbing approaches or treatment interventions, and irrigation, of which we'll touch on closed pulse irrigation shortly. And additionally, there is shock debridement approaches, and that's usually when the patient is brought to the OR for an aggressive um, debridement of unhealthy tissue or conservative. Now, physical therapists in the past had used hydrotherapy quite aggressively in treating wounds, and that was by using whirlpools. The objective of using a whirlpool was to increase vasodilation and blood flow and help to soften or loosen any necrotic tissue and clean the wounds, but also help with pain management. For hydrotherapy, specifically using a whirlpool, some of the indications of treatment could be for necrotic wounds or wounds that have moderate to heavy exudate, wounds that have debris in it, ischemic wounds, or wounds that can tolerate moderate to increased heavy circulation perfusion. Some of the contraindications are clean granulating wounds, epithelializing wounds, new skin grafts, new tissue flaps, venous ulcers, and non-necrotic diabetic ulcers. Today, we don't see Whirlpool used as much as we did in past related to wound care. However, a new intervention has been developed to address the use of water and wound irrigation. Physical therapists are, have available to them a new technique called Coles Pulse Irrigation that has been developed by Dr. Patrick Marasco, pictured here. And it goes back to the 1970s and is used currently, but the treatment intervention has progressed over time. What this treatment intervention does is provides pressurized pulse solution to the wound bed via a handheld device in a closed environment. Its purpose is to irrigate the wound bed with pre precise pressure. It facilitates debridement and can remove debris in the wound. It also reduces bacteria and infection with risk and promotes granulation. The benefits of using closed pulse irrigation is that it's a closed environment. As you see pictured here, this is a bag system whereby when irrigating the wound, none of the, none of the uh, bacteria is aerosolized because it is enclosed and captured within this bag system. It is much less labor intensive than an actual whirlpool. The beauty of this treatment is now we are able to control the p pressure provided by the irrigation solution. And it is now controlled down to 18 to 8 to 15 psi, where in the earlier stages, by using irrigators, the pressure was at 80 to 90, which was not only removing unhealthy tissue, but healthy tissue as well. There is a great benefit to this intervention because we are able to access undermining and tunneling wounds with specific tips. And there are virtually no contraindications for using this technique. This treatment can be a little bit expensive, but comparing this cost of the intervention to a non-healing wound definitely is outweighed in benefit. I'm going to toss this back to um, Anne, who we are going to start talking about our case studies. Thanks, Cheryl. So the case studies we're about to present to you hopefully will give you an idea of how we use a multidisciplinary approach to get to the best outcome, both clinically and financially, for the resident or patient involved. So there's a lot of details that come into play, but we want to focus on that big picture of what's the positive outcome that we can get by bringing a team approach to this. So we're going to start with one of Cheryl's cases. Thanks, Ian. Um, this is a 68-year-old male who was referred to physical therapy because of a non-healing wound on the bottom of his right foot that had tendon involvement for six months. This patient um, sustained the injury when he was walking in his backyard and recalled stepping on a rock. He noticed the area when he was changing for bed that evening as he found some blood on his sock. Some important past medical, risk, uh, medical history includes that he was a right uh, total knee um, two years ago, obese, and also had a 
poor diet with uncontrolled blood glucose levels. His primary diagnosis was diabetes and treatment diagnosis was the open wound of the toe. Um, before uh, ha sustaining this wound, the patient lived independently and was um, independent with their self-care and community skills. Um, he needs to, um, he lives with his wife for 42 years and other family members live in within two miles. When looking at the wound clinically, you can see that it's pretty involved. It's got a lot of slough. Um, there are calloused edges around the wound and the surrounding skin is scaly and dry. There is um, minimal foul odor when the dressing was removed and the pulses are intact. The patient denies pain. However, there is some decreased sensation noted to light touch on both of the feet. Um, from a treatment standpoint intervention, this is a great example of how the partnership with it, nursing and therapy works. Um, the therapists coordinate the care with nursing for appropriate dressings and treatment and medical management of the patient's primary um, medical diagnosis of diabetes and working on disease process education. Um, along with when the patient was mo mobile or is mobile, providing some education and support and training um, on mobility and self-care with their caregivers. From a physical therapist standpoint, we actively are involved treating this wound um, with modalities. Our role is to coordinate our care and service with the nursing team. We want to be smart and communicate about what type of modalities we are using and be sensitive to the type of treatment and dressing that is being utilized. So for example, because the patient had slough, you know, we, we want to make sure that if they've chosen a silver dressing, we very, be very cognizant of the fact that all of that silver needs to be removed before we introduce electricity into the wounds because silver is a conductivity agent of electricity. We're actively involved in partnering with the education process, not only about disease process, but the wound and how to um, take care of the wound and treatments and dressings, and also diet and education. Um, we worked very hard on offloading this wound so that we could facilitate optimal healing, control pain, and teaching the patient skin inspections and how to look and monitor on a daily basis for any challenges to the healing process. The second case study is a um, home care patient who was a 65-year-old male that was referred to physical therapy because of a full thickness venous stasis ulcer on his distal medial left leg. His past medical history included coronary artery bypass surgery about two years ago, at which time the saphenous vein was removed for the graft. He's currently on oral medication to manage his hypertension. His primary diagnosis is coronary insufficiency and we are treating a venous stasis ulcer. Um, this wound has significantly impacted this patient's activities. Um, unfortunately, he stopped attending um, his biweekly um, church, uh, his biweekly bingo games and weekly church services about four months ago because he found that the prolonged sitting activities made his left leg swell and hurt because we, he, and he was embarrassed by his constant weeping ulcers. He also had decreased physical activity at home, spending most of the day indoors in his recliner with his legs up rather than his real passion, which was gardening for two hours when the weather permitted. He reported that his ankle is often uncomfortable and uh, to move and that the swelling worsens when he is upright for more than one hour. So from a clinical assessment standpoint, the wound um, is on the distal media left leg. Um, it is, has a red base fully covered with granulating tissue. Um, there are no odors. There is darkening around the wound edges of the intact skin around the ulcer. Um, the sensation and pain assessment reveal that the ulcer is minimally painful. 
However, there are frequent dressing changes that were required because of the heavy drainage from the site. There was pretty significant edema. The patient had um, in the left foot, ankle, and leg. Um, ankle girth measurements at the medial malleolus showed 9 inches on the right and 10 and a half inches on the left. And range of motion was pretty limited as well, which would impact this patient's functional mobility. Again, this is a great example of coordinating care with nursing for choosing the appropriate dressings and treatment and coordinating pain and blood pressure management along with edema management control. As therapists, we worked really hard with the nursing team to, to coordinate care and provide education on mobility and self-care training with the caregivers. As physical therapists, we performed active wound treatment and chose appropriate modalities to treat this venous stasis ulcer. When we were able to control the, uh, or facilitate wound healing, we also simultaneously worked on the patient's mobility and addressed appropriate footwear along with um, providing some uh, additional adaptive devices to help offload and to uh, facilitate edema management by developing a um, positioning schedule for the patient and to enhance the patient's self-care provided some additional adaptive equipment devices such as reachers, et cetera. Now case study three is a very significant case study because this is a young 56-year-old morbidly obese female who was referred to physical therapy because of a non-healing surgical wound from a DNC. Unfortunately, this wound was, um, had been diagnosed as necrotizing fasciitis. And treatment up until this point in time of referral was a wound vac. Um, this, pa this wound was tremendous in size, as you can see by the um, measurements. Uh, it was 100% yellow slough. Um, the wound had significantly impact in the patient's activities as she was confined to her bed due to her uncontrolled pain and that she could not transfer or ambulate due to her weakness. Again, this wound was considered chronic with a substantial size and depth covered with 100% slough. The peri wound edges were red and warm. There was foul odor when the dressings were removed and copious amounts of serous sanguinous fluid um, was found after the TID dressing changes. A big impairment for this patient was the fact that she had uncontrolled pain at rest and was unable to be managed by her prescribed narcotics. So our interventions in partnership with nursing as a priority was to get this patient's pain under control and what can we do to help facilitate pain management in partnering with nursing. We also looked at how, what appropriate dressings and treatment um, would be appropriate for uh, this patient's wound given the size of the wound, the location of the wound, et cetera. And we did coordinate our active treatment um, by using, we actually used Cole's pulse irrigation on this patient on a daily basis. And we needed to coordinate our uh, interventions with the dressing changes with nursing to facilitate wound healing. Once the patient was uh, stabilized with pain and developed, uh, the pain was better managed and un under control, we worked on mobility such as bed mobility, transfer techniques, self-care activities, and eventually gait mobility uh, activities. Um, we were able to work with her caregivers on these techniques and ultimately we healed this wound and I'm thrilled to tell you all that um, this patient was discharged back home to the community with a healed wound. Cheryl, those are some great cases that you've brought forth to us. Um, I'm going to continue on with a, a few brief cases I'm, from my end. Um, one of my favorite patients I've seen through all of my years of wound care, a 64-year-old male with a history of diabetes. He was a very active gentleman. 
He was a linesman with the NFL, so he was the guy with the chains on the side marking that first down at, at every Bears game here in Chicago, um, and was really dedicated to his life and to the sport. Um, he had a history of diabetes, but he controlled it well despite his um, long hours and his active lifestyle. What happened to this guy is that he was at a preseason game that was held on a, a, at a stadium with artificial turf. Um, it was an unusually warm September, and the temperature on the turf got up over 103 degrees. And unbeknownst to him, because of decreased sensation in his feet due to his diabetes, uh, when he got back to the locker room at the end of the game and pulled off his shoes and socks, he pulled off uh, a significant amount of skin along with those socks and ended up with full thickness burns to the bottom of both his feet. Uh, when I saw him, the wounds had been debrided and they were pink and granulating. He had some drainage, but not excessive. We had good defined wound edges, but the healing had stalled. And was that due to his diabetes? Was that due to the chronic nature of the wounds? We couldn't tell. Um, the other thing was that was uh, equally as troubling to the patient was that his gait was altered because of these large burns on his feet. He was um, changing his gait to keep pressure off his feet. And that was resulting in hip pain, which was then uh, impacting his lifestyle and his mobility as well. So we needed to look at these wounds and see what we could do to get them jump-started again. And because we had a clean wound bed and nice clean edges, it was a matter of restarting that healing process in the wound bed. So we started out with some collagen dressings and eventually moved to one of the biologically engineered skin grafts and did multiple application of those over a three-month period and closed those wounds up. But more importantly is we got physical therapy involved and occupational therapy involved so that we got the right orthotics in his shoes so that we were offloading those wound sites and not aggravating them, which allowed him to remain mobile and active. Um, we got OT working with him in the home to make sure that as he was moving about the home, he was safe with these new shoes that were changing his gait. And we um, made sure physical therapy worked with him on, on retraining his gait so that we prevented falls with him. And so he did heal these wounds up in the course of time, but it was definitely that team approach that really led him to that healing. Um, it was not just the wounds we were healing, it was the whole uh, picture that we had to address. My other case study is a young woman as well. She was 42 years old with a history of lupus, and she was hospitalized for an exacerbation of the lupus. Despite the fact that she was on a low air loss mattress in the hospital, she developed four stage four pressure ulcers. And that was due to friction and shearing. Um, she didn't have pressure because of the low air loss mattress, but they were not mobilizing her appropriately in the bed. And so due to friction and shearing, she broke down. She was hospitalized for so long that she exhausted her Medicare benefit. And so they sent her home to us in home care and said, keep her alive for 60 days until her benefits renew, and then we'll rehospitalize her and do something about these wounds. Well, our team got together and said, that's just not good enough to keep her alive for 60 days. We're going to do whatever we possibly can. So we got the team approach going in the home. We did a home assessment uh, to make sure that we could get the best environment for her there. We did get a pressure-reducing mattress in the home for her, and then we had physical therapy and occupational therapy come in and work with the patient and with family members to maximize her mobility in that bed appropriately so we didn't aggravate those wounds. We also looked at the big picture of the wounds and decided on a plan of care. And unfortunately, the dressings that were required were rather expensive. So they got kicked out by Medicare as being excessively um, uh, costly, and they weren't going to pay the claim to the home health agency. We took the case to an administrative law judge to mediate. And when he looked at the wound photographs, he looked at the progress of the patient, and he looked at the communication between the team members, noting that we had a, a multi-pronged approach to keep her in a well state and return her and keep her in her home. Um, he overrode the uh, rejection, and the home health agency did get paid for the supplies and the care that they provided to this woman. So not only did we keep her in her home, we kept her healthier, and we healed three or four of the ulcers uh, while she was at home, and she was rehospitalized for a flap graft on the fourth ulcer many months down the road. So that team approach was both um, beneficial to the patient, 
it was beneficial to the system because we kept her at home, and we know that care at home is cheaper than care in a skilled facility, whether it's uh, acute or post-acute, and um, it ultimately saved money for the system overall. So looking at our agenda, let's talk about a few practical tips about bringing rehab into the wound care team real quickly. Um, it's really important that we get buy-in at all levels and that everybody has a shared goal. So we have to make sure that when we're doing this team approach that uh, we get nursing, we get rehab, and then we get administration and all the department heads, everyone in agreement that this is a team sport and that we're going to approach this as a team sport so we don't have separate objectives. Um, once administrative administration supports it, then it's likely going to take hold and be successful. If you don't have administrative support leading the charge, it's not likely to be successful. We want to create a culture of quality care, and that means that that team care and that team approach is most important. I once consulted to a small group of skilled facilities um, in western Illinois and eastern Iowa, right on the state border there. And they took, took a very high acuity level patient, lots of pairs and quads, um, resided in their facility. And twice a year I would go out and do their prevention, uh, awareness, and skills workshop. And it never ceased to amaze me that when I would go in to do those workshops, everyone attended, and I mean everyone. It was the dietary department, the people who passed the trays, the, um, the janitors and maintenance department, as well as all of nursing department and rehab department. It was everybody's responsibility to make sure that they were addressing the needs of their residents and preventing pressure ulcer formation. So whether that meant that um, the, the housekeeper noticed that a bed wasn't functioning properly or a patient wasn't positioned properly in bed and then that housekeeper would notify nursing to take some action or whether it was the hairdresser making sure that she worked with physical therapy and had the appropriate cushions on her chair so when residents came in for their perms, they weren't sitting for a long time on an inappropriate surface. Everybody was involved. And it was really, really a great approach to um, keeping their facility acquired numbers down as well as to addressing the overall wellness of the residents within their building. Cheryl, how, what would you like to contribute? Well, I think it's a high priority that physical therapists, as I stated earlier, um, need to have a passion for their wound care. Um, we need to make sure that, uh, that, that this is something that they really, really enjoy. Um, and it's not every therapist that loves wound care. Um, so besides that passion, they then need to have that skill set and competency with working with wounds. And um, so it's not only the active treatment, but it could be the prevention um, as the initial phase of involving therapy. Um, so how are we positioning or how can we best facilitate wound healing by offloading, for example, is a great um, intervention. So therefore, you know, it's very important that, um, you know, the therapist and, the, and the, it become an integral part of the team and, and start out perhaps with someone who is excited about taking care of patients who have wounds and then provide some education and training and develop in that skill set and competency. So um, from a, I'm sorry, okay. Ann, go right. Go okay. Cheryl. Thanks. So from um, a nursing and therapy standpoint, it's a high priority that we use the same wound documentation. Um, and generally speaking, most teams are conducting wound rounds on a weekly basis. And so that's where perhaps we are looking at all of the wounds in the facility and we're sizing and staging and looking at treatments and dressings and interventions. Um, and therapists need to provide documentation in their, in their as regards to progress, and quite often we will use wound measurements as our source of progress. However, we need to make sure that we are referencing and using the documentation that nursing is using. We do not want to have conflicting documentation in regards to the wounds because it will just set up for a problem and challenge, especially as it relates to survey. We absolutely have to partner when it comes to dressing changes. Um, PT may need to remove the dressing or treatment. 
Um, and if we are doing that, we need to make sure that we are timing that dressing and treatment um, intervention appropriately. We don't want to have to remove the dressing to provide intervention, such as doing um, a modality, if the dressing has just been changed. So therefore, we need to coordinate that care with nursing in particular so that we can save money, time, and any patient discomfort. As I mentioned earlier, if you're considering introducing electric, electricity into the wound, um, we have to really work with nursing on the type of treatment that's being chosen and consider the conductivity of some of the treatments that are used. And if we are using electricity, making sure that it's appropriate for how the wound is presenting um, to get the best results. Of course, we want to make sure that we are coordinating pain management. Um, and we need to communicate um, with nursing to provide pain, manage, pain meds prior to any rehab interventions so that we can get the patient to be able to opt optimally function and provide uh, a great treatment intervention and get the best benefit for our rehab approaches. Um, and so if PT is doing and is involved in dressing changes, then perhaps nursing needs to administer those pain meds in advance. We have the opportunity to partner with um, regards to positioning and or posture devices. So therapists can provide in-servicing to nursing and caregivers on repositioning in the bed um, and chair and any of the other various techniques that we know and or adaptive devices that help to relieve pressure. Particularly when therapy is issuing a cushion, nursing needs to make sure that we are using that properly, um, including position and proper inflation on the seating surface. Additionally, using support surfaces, we could uh, have the opportunity to provide some education within the clinical team. And it's important that we provide education on an ongoing basis and have documentation in regards to the education we've performed. Terrific. Thanks so much, Cheryl. Uh, so just to review, I hope that you've been able to um, be illuminated a little bit on uh, the role of the physical therapy and, and uh, rehab department, the role of the nursing department, and how integrating those two departments can really strengthen and um, broaden the scope and the excellence uh, of wound care that you offer within your facilities and organization. Hope those case studies pointed out how that teamwork um, is so beneficial to the end results of the patient. And, and those practical tips of how do you choose who your players are on your team um, so that we get the best approach from the best people. So I'm going to turn it back to Deb. She's got a question or two um, from the audience, and so we're going to see what they have for us today. We know you guys have to run, so we'll wrap this one up quickly, but we wanted to give a big shout out of thanks to Wound Rounds, one of our sponsors today. Wound Rounds is a point of care wound management and prevention system with an incredible list of benefits and deliverables in settings um, all across North America. And also a shout out to uh, Post-Acute Consulting. Uh, they are one of our co-sponsors today, and they are excellent specialists in clinical care. They do consulting, compliance, and reimbursement work. Um, wanted to now turn the floor over to a question. We got a great question that came in today about reimbursement. And as I'm teeing this up for our two speakers, I wanted to point out to you the contact information for the speakers. So if you have additional questions, feel free to contact them offline. But a question has come in in the area of reimbursement. And um, one of our viewers has noted that while we listed the criteria for reimbursement, it's not clear if those criteria also transfer to other modalities such as diathermy. And Cheryl, I was wondering if that's an area that you might be able to address for us. Yes, thank you, Deb. I'm happy to do that. Um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have specifically issued um, advisement in and around pressure ulcer treatment as it relates to e-STEM. Um, so that criteria that I described in regards to the 30 days of conventional healing has to be a stage 3 or greater, specifically apply to e-STEM and e-STEM alone. 
And then is, is that also then true for diathermy? Is, are there um, criteria for that, or um, can you help guide us in that area, Cheryl? Correct, yes. So um, it's just specific to the ESTEM um, intervention, and so, mo so the use of diathermy is not specific like ESTEM is. So um, no, diathermy doesn't have any specific reimbursement criteria like ESTEM. Thank you. Cheryl and Anne, I wanted to thank both of you for your um, excellent overview today. And I also wanted to thank your companies, Wound Rounds and Post Acute Consulting, for hosting today's webinar. And to remind everyone on the phone that you have opportunities to contact the speakers outside of this event and to check your email for um, an email from Wound Rounds, which will contain the handouts from today's session, as well as a link to an archive of this webinar. So I'm Deb Kurtz, and I will sign off today. And thank you all for joining us. And please watch your email for upcoming webinar opportunities from Wound Rounds. Thanks again for joining us, and thank you, speakers.